Okay, good morning. I think we've started the broadcast. So uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for joining us today to uh, discuss the Australian electricity transition. My name is Mark Andrews and I head up Lloyd's Renewables in Asia Pacific. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's session with a diverse range of panel members who will share with you their thoughts on the transition of the electrical system from traditional to renewable generation. This is a recorded webinar, so if you do leave, um, we, you will be able to listen to it and see it at a later date. So we'll be sending through all participants an email of the recording directly after the session. So without, uh, without further ado, let's kick off. Okay. So the agenda for today will be pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll fly through the welcome and introductions and get straight into the panel discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, pl please send them through and we'll pose them to the panel at the end of the session. Uh, and all going to plan, we should be finished by about 10.30. Now, uh, by way of introductions, if you're not familiar with Lloyd's Register, we are a technical engineering firm um, founded about 250 years ago in the, the Lloyd's Coffee House in London. Uh, most people won't be aware that Lloyd's Register is also actually a charity. We have a single shareholder called the LR Foundation, and this foundation um, supports engineering related research, education and public engagement around the world. Uh, for the benefit of public safety on the sea, land and in the air. So all of our profits actually go back to society. Ella's footprint is global and we have over 190 offices worldwide and 8,000 employees. And we have over 60,000 clients in sectors ranging from energy to maritime to cyber security and to food safety. Uh, in terms of, well, at a, at a high level, we focus on technology solutions for our clients that improve safety, performance of complex critical infrastructure and supply chains. And we support clients through the entire energy supply chain, uh, whether it be traditional, so oil and gas and coal, to nuclear, uh, onshore and offshore re renewables or emerging technology such as hydrogen or a tidal. Uh, at a local level here in Australia, we have been established in the renewable space for over 13 years and we have supported the development of over 11 gigawatts of renewable generation in Australia alone. Now, moving on to today's panellists, I'd like to introduce our members. So, first up, we have Dr. Tony Morton from LR. Uh, Tony is LR's Global Technical Head for Grid and Power Systems and has been active in the modelling and analysis of power systems for an industry and academia for 20 years. Uh, when Tony is not helping LR's clients, he moonlights as an ex expert assessor for the Australian Research Council, associate editor of the Journal of Control Engineering Practice, reviewer for the IEEE transactions on power delivery, and an adjunct professor, uh, associate professor at Monash University. Uh, Tony, just want to give everybody a wave. There we go. Uh, next up, we have uh, Stephen Sailors from uh, Vestas Wind Systems America. Uh, Steve is Vestas' internal subject matter expert on electrical power generation systems, wind turbine design, and transmission system interconnection integration issues. He is based out of Portland in the US and his career of 50 years has spanned the development of generation across all technology types, including coal, nuclear, geothermal, to now solar and wind, along with the development of transmission and distribution projects. Steve is a life senior member of the IEEE and is on the adjunct faculty of Portland Community College and the Oregon Institute of Technology. Thanks, Stephen. Um, next up, we have, uh, from Res, we have Tom, Tom Hanselman. Uh, Tom originally decided to join the wind industry after discovering the beauty, beauty of a wind turbine on an auto barn in 2002. After returning to Australia, he spent the early part of his career simply explaining to the general public what a wind turbine was, whilst in the background focusing on grid connection and working for various OEMs in engineering management. 
Uh, Tom now heads up Res's Australian affiliate as the engineering based engineering manager based in Melbourne. And lastly, but not least, we have Andrew Paver from AMO. Uh, Andrew is a principal analyst in the Future Energy Systems team in AMO. He's recently led a study on the effects of VRE on frequency control as part of AMO's renewable integration study. And Andrew has over 10 years experience in the power industry, including time at New Zealand system, system operator, where he worked on the market tools responsible for frequency management. I'd like to keep, uh, thank all of our esteemed panelists uh, for joining me today and taking the time to be part of this discussion. Uh, to begin with, I think everyone we have on the panel is more than aware of the challenges facing the industry, uh, particularly in Australia, uh, relating to the integration of renewables into the existing grid. Um, we're now at a point where it is cheaper to generate a megawatt from solar PV or wind than it is from the existing thermal plants. Uh, and based only on this fact, Mark, powers should cause renewables to replace existing thermal generation completely. However, it is not just market forces at play here and the sector is seeing a number of challenges with integrating new variable generation. These challenges range from regulatory hurdles and lifting of the bar to grid connection, um, system strength development and provision of transmission infrastructure to also the integration and acceptance of alternative technologies for maintaining grid operations. Uh, and and based on this, I would like to discuss with our panel their place in being part of and solving these challenges. Um, so let's let's start with yourself, Tom. As a broad question, what role do you provide as a developer in supporting the wider goals of a majority renewable system apart from simply supplying megawatts? And I'll uh, I'll I would Thank you, Mark, as you, as you pull up that presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm truly excited at the, where we are in the industry today. I've, as I say, I started in the industry back in the early 2000s and uh, was excited back then um, when we were burgeoning. And uh, now there's, there's so many great challenges that we can all play a part in. Um, so I'll just talk a bit about what, what we as a developer and, and what we do as a construction manager, also asset manager, but really primarily in the development of projects what part we have to play. So you can get onto the next slide there for me, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, which, yes, there we go. So look, a fundamental one, first dot point, we've got a big part to play, as the, do every other um, player in, in this market, in this industry. Um, and what I wanted to, to really deploy here is that sustainability is not just uh, something for our energy sources, it needs to be of the way we structure our our entities, our businesses, our industry. I think that is fundamental to um, ending up with reliability and st stability and resilience. Um, that it also needs to be part of the, the cultures that we emanate and we live um, in in our businesses and in our teams. It's not just in our technology. Going on to the technology, though, of course, because that's where where the uh, where it'll uh, get down to the nuts and bolts. Um, we as a developer need to be thinking about those values of reliability, stability, resilience at the time when we're out there looking for a project. It's not just when we're trying to pass it on to a to an end owner or you know trying to get it into financial close stage, trying to close out a, a connection agreement. That that needs to be the product of the thinking that's gone in at the beginning. So just looking at Where's our connection point? Is it appropriate? Have we considered future augmentations? Obviously, there's a lot of those um, coming at the moment, which provide a lot of exciting opportunities. We also need to think about where where they, you know, there could be less positive outcomes as well. Um, we need to think about about constraints, uh, MLFs. We need to think about the cutting topologies. It's not necessarily just. Uh, uh, putting a substation next to the closest set of, of uh, three conductors that are passing by the hillside where we've chosen to put our, our wind turbines. What are we doing for robustness in, in our connection to the grid? Um, fundamental, you know, is one circuit enough of a cut in? Generated technology, it's an exciting time. Um, you know, we've obviously we've got type three, type four turbines, but now there's obviously the need for 
or the, the, the talk and the need for, for grid forming technology in various uh, parts of wind, solar storage. What are we doing to reach out um, and, and to give those signals to, to the OEMs? It is needed and uh, Australia really you know, wants to, needs to continue breaking new ground there. Um, control systems, again, it's a common theme, but having a good control system doesn't just materialize in a, in a VCS that you did deliver to AMO um, late in a connection application process. It needs to be fundamental in the way we pull together our generating systems and we need to push our designers. We as developers can't just hang back and think that we've engaged somebody who's got a lot of letters after their name and, and therefore it'll be, it'll be adequate. We need to push, we need to take on the right people to, to design the generating systems of the future. Um, and if you haven't got the right people working for you on that, then go get them. Go get, don't, don't re-employ the, uh, the, uh, the, the party who hasn't delivered a good generating system for you in the past. Um, uh, internal reticulation, I mean, you know, there's still big, gen obviously there's more and more big generating systems being, being proposed now. Is there, is there appropriate design philosophy you bring brought to bear there? Are people just going low voltage, you know, 33 kV medium voltage throughout, or is there some intelligence being brought into bear on satellite substations, etc.? cetera? Um, well, there's a common theme here about, about bringing really robust, uh, deep analysis and engineering into, into the way we develop our generating systems and how we bring them to bear, how we transition from, from the drawing board to, to reality out in the field. If you could jump onto the next slide, Mark. Sure thing, Tom. Um, just here, I'm talking a bit more about nuts and bolts, sort of jumping into more of the, some, some of the particular specifics, um, uh, case studies, essentially. And I've borrowed here, uh, thanks, Andrew, from, from the ISP, which needs to be a, a well-thumbed tone for all of us by now. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the key messages in this left-hand box um, was in regard to the impact of, of gas prices and, and the view that gas prices are going to are going to take uh, uh, gas peaking plants out of the out of the realm of of, of just uh, working through our, our peaks and troughs in the market. So storage is a big part of our future um, in this market. So we as a developer and and others in in the industry need to be really thinking about how we're going to deploy storage um, and, and lithium ion is, is obviously, uh, as, as noted in the ISP, is, is the current uh, lever to be pulled there. So it's really for developers to think, I mean, that the business model is still a bit of a struggle for all of us, um, but how are we gonna deploy that to ensure that we, we bring that robustness and resilience to the, to the market in the years to come? And in the box on the right-hand side, look, it's a, it's a bugbear for us that we see, um, we, or, or, or we perceive that um, when it comes to constraints, it's still not something that people seem to be grappling with at a sufficiently deep level. Um, yeah, thermal constraints, that's pretty easy. We've been doing that for many years, but when you reach down into voltage or transient stability, or God forbid, oscillatory stability, is there enough um, understanding across the industry and uh, yeah, a deep enough dive um, at, at all phases of the projects to understand that, to make sure we're making intelligent decisions. And then on the next slide, this is a personal, they're all personal um, passions of mine, but it's its definitely one I wouldn't wanna, wanna um, not uh, make use of the soapbox, the soft tissue, the, uh, the people, all, all the previous discussion points there were about intelligent decisions and, 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 and making sure that we have well-engineered solutions. Well, that doesn't happen without engineers. Um, when I was getting blooded in, I was I was learning a lot. I was really getting mentored by Wizen Head um, engineers who had had you know come through graduate programs with the ESC, etc. Um, and I'm truly thankful for that. And and I see it as you know personally as really important to to give back to the industry and the, the next generation of engineers coming through. So um, yeah. I suppose that's a message for all of us to be mindful of, of, uh, of, of passing that, that baton on to the next generation. And in reading the ISP, I, there were so many new acronyms I needed to, um, 
to learn. So that's why I developed my one at the bottom of the page here, distributed social responsibility. Um, but I think that's across the industry to, to keep mindful of. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. I, and I can certainly uh, agree with you on the, um, the tightness on resources in the Australian market as well. Now I'd like to um, I'd like to pose the same similar question through to Stephen yourself. So um, from a uh, an OEM, so from a Vestas or an international perspective, um, what role uh, do you play as a um, in supporting the wider goal, goals of majority renewable um, system? Well, Vestas is very con very involved with the whole concept of renewables. Uh, of course, we started out in wind in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and we're leaders, always been leaders in wind. Last four, five years, we've been looking at expanding out into hybrid solutions and doing, uh, taking full EPC uh, responsibility on contracts for uh, projects uh, where we do integrate wind, solar, and uh, energy storage into one composite power plant. Uh, Obviously, probably everyone in Australia and certainly in this audience knows uh, our Kennedy project down in Australia and the uh, successes and challenges we've had with that. Uh, it's a, a good learning curve for us all uh, internally with investors, but certainly uh, we would like to have these learnings uh, expressed throughout the industry through our key working groups and forums we, we deal with uh, nationally and internationally. So from that point of view, we, uh, the company seemed, must take a major role in leading energy uh, development for the future and leading the course of where we're, uh, our resources are gonna come from in the, in the future. We're, <laughs> we've done the, I would like to say, we had a very, we had a successful first half even within this pandemic uh, in that, not much of a profit, but we have turned a profit this, this particular half, and we're looking for the second half to be better and, and coming out of this whole pandemic. Uh, and this would be one of my themes expressed is that coming out of this pandemic, I think we should kind of reinvent the American, the North American grid to, to a degree and uh, solidify commitment to that and take the next decade or two to migrate to that new future. And, and are you seeing, um, is Vestas involved in any, uh, uh, or are you seeing much technology that will help the transition to, um, uh, to a higher level of renewable integration? Well, certainly. Uh, I mean, I, I could cover my, my five uh, issues here very quickly, but certainly one of the, several of those, uh, go back to the, the page before that. The previous slide, yep. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things, the, the first one is providing system plans with better simulation uh, tools and models. Uh, the unified model format, uh, we believe, is, is uh, a very successful way to go for the future, where we put together basically the machine and the, uh, the actual software logic, control logic, into uh, a real time, basically operating control system uh, simulate that, uh, convert that into a simulation tool, and then put wrappers for a RMS, or root mean square, or dynamic type of uh, software format like uh, PSSE or PSLF that we use sensibly here in North America, uh, or use that same basic uh, UMF, uh, put the uh, an EMT wrapper like a UPS CAD uh, on it, then you the thing is you've got a direct correlation between actual machine code and actual control response. Not as all models are, are reduced simulations of the real world because we can't put the whole world in there, obviously, but we put in the major stuff and we as engineers figure out what is important and what we can neglect. Uh, but this idea of moving past uh, generic models, 15 years ago, our idea was, was generic models and that because the planners needed something more simplified than the user-defined models that all of us different developers are giving them. And that is good for planning. So my, the purpose of this, this first point is that 
yes, we need to improve our simulation models for the system planners, but also don't use the, the model you're using for <clears throat> long range planning purposes for interconnection and trying to tune the plant to get it interconnected and commission the working properly with the grid. There's a two different directives, two different goals. So tune your models first with a user defined model. Uh, I think we need to change our tariffs to uh, demand EMT type models also because of the uh, conditions we're seeing on the grid, the challenges, weak grid, uh, all, all the other issues we're seeing along those lines. So that's the first item there. And then the, below that, uh, several different bullet points related to the different entities uh, here in North America and globally are setting total 150 to 100 percent renewable targets here uh, mm -hmm. and anywhere from the starting in the next few years uh, going over 10 years to, to 15 years and out to 2050. Uh, DOE did a study in 2015 I participated in where we looked at what was going to be the conditions out to 2050 and when should we be integrating this but I think we need to do this quicker than 2050. Uh, I like to see these targets, these aggressive targets like California for 2035 and 2040. And, uh, and the thing is, uh, some of the things that are happening here, certainly we're having ongoing thermal uh, plant shutdowns. Coal is uh, going away to a large degree. It went from half of our generation in the United States to so less than a quarter now. And uh, in, as far as my influence, whatever it is in the industry, I will be pushing to, uh, we don't need to do coal anymore. And we can phase it all. Everything needs to be phased properly. This is my last bullet point there, kind of uh, specifically for grid uh, following versus grid uh, forming type inverters. When do we, uh, we need to strike that balance. We don't have to have all grid forming converters for the future, but uh, we start integrating some in key areas uh, to figure out how they, they, they play well. And we are doing studies through uh, EPRI and NRO back in the here in the United States to see, yeah, there could be, uh, we could go for like 20% grid forming, 80% following, and then keep shifting that as these retirements of the thermal units keep happening too. So it's a balance of keeping that whole uh, generation mix uh, proper and, and properly tuned. That's going to be the big, uh, problem in the future, the old analog slow motion, uh, well, it's not slow motion in comparison to the electronics, but the fast electronics have got different time constants and uh, we've got to make both systems work together. And eventually we can minimize the, the older synchronous machines and analog systems out and, and really provide the kind of dynamic uh, control we'd like to see. I've always wanted to see on the grid since I came to the industry in the, the mid 70s early 70s so mm -hmm. uh, along with that uh, nothing we can be doing and what we are doing is looking at repurposing transmission lines here in the united states uh this my first example the inner mountain it was the first project i worked on when i was a young engineer still in college and working on this this dc hvdc line to come out of this coal unit in idaho to feed los angeles that is just now after my 40 years in the, uh, the career of the designing these kinds of systems on a grand scale that uh, that project has done its 40 year life cycle and it's, it's done, it's complete. But we've got that huge, that huge uh, pipe in the air that we can use and then take renewables, uh, solar and wind from the uh, heavy rich solar Wyoming area and Montana area and pump this to other parts of the country. Uh, so this is, it's in the, my second kind of point on this is uh, convert AC to DC. Uh, that way you're, you're eliminating right of way issues and things like that, uh, new, new right of way buys and things like that. Uh, uh, and then looking at new DC, uh, my example here is a, uh, a four gigawatt line that is right now installed by the government, by TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, basically that would feed wind rich Oklahoma wind power to the south, which is very, very wind poor. Mm -hmm. um, it's competition. The, we all know competition in this industry. I was looking back on this uh, kind of to some points. If you want to go to the next slide, Mark. 
uh, kind of this last point down here about microgrids. Uh, one of the things I'm very, very key on is trying to promote as I transition to retirement is getting microgrid offerings uh, off the board and uh, make them economical and being able to be utilized in remote locations. Uh, my, my thought comes from the arguments we had about 10 years ago for five years of how we we're going to electrify Africa more, more ably. And uh, one of the major sides or proponents on the side was build more coal plants and put more transmission in. And I think that uh, we, I've seen microgrids now that are large can take up not only cities, but counties. Are, and of course, it's not one microgrid. We have multiple microgrids to make them independent and safe and, and, and safe with cybersecurity, um, which is kind of the opposite as I, the, my last uh, few words down here in this, this bullet was the opposite of what we did in the United States in the 1930s with our rural electrification uh, efforts. TVA, BPA, the Texas, uh, the rural uh, electrification administrations and things like that, they kind of forced uh, transmission lines and, and right of way, uh, you know, eminent domain issues on people that uh, you know, we may not need to do all that again if we can repurpose uh, back with the other point. Um, which gives me up to this point now, more serious national cybersecurity efforts here. Uh, we're all playing at this, it, it, what I've seen. Now, we, we've gone serious like 10 years ago for cybersecurity um, when literally a disgruntled employee could, uh, from a wind company could have the tools to burn up a wind turbine and start you know, damage on wind plants because the security was just not there. I mean, software and hardware. So we do need to harden our, these power electronics if we're moving to power electronics, more converters and grids. We've got to make them harder, not only for cyber war, but or EMP, electromagnetic uh, pulses, or uh, geomagnetic disturbances for the solar disturbances and things like that. We're going to heavy on electronics, we've got to harden this system up somehow, both software and hardware. Yeah. Thanks for that, Steve. I certainly hadn't considered that last point there about the cybersecurity. Um, all very interesting points about what's what's happening over on the in the US at the moment. Might um might just quickly move on to give um, some of the other panelists uh, an opportunity to answer the similar question. But but thank you. So move on to yourself, Andrew. Um, from a, a regulator's perspective and from your perspective, um, what is uh, how are you guys helping the transition of um, renewables and integration of renewables? Uh, certainly in your role in the, the future energy systems team and, and the RIT, there, there must certainly be some um, uh, alignment there. Sure, thanks Mark. So um, AEMO's role is threefold. We have a function in operating the system as well as operating the market and we also have a role in planning, system planning, a, a planning function. But what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how that system operator role is changing, particularly with regard to security. So this is something that AMO has been looking at recently as part of the renewable integration study that was published in April this year. And the question we asked was just that, standing here at 20, 2020, looking out to 2025, what are some of the things that are likely to pop up that could limit the amount of renewables online above those conventional network constraints that um, Tom was talking about. Um, so there's a bit of a graphic here, um, which is quite complex, but I think it's useful in showing when various things start to become material. So when we're talking about operating above 50% renewables, we could mean a range of things, but for system security, it's the instantaneous penetration that's important or the total amount of wind and solar online as a proportion of underlying demand. And we can see that there on the horizontal axis. Um, so at the moment, we're at around 50% penetration, which you can see by those gray dots, which are actual measurements from a half hour period. Um, but our planning report, the integrated system plan says that by 2025, we could have an additional 10 to 20 gigawatts of renewable um, capacity installed, um, depending on the scenario. So that's those red and orange dots there. But th that can take us to some much higher penetrations, but there's some challenges to get there. So firstly, um, 
there's that yellow area of that chart there coming in at 25%. So where we're already operating and that's indicating some challenges with distributed PV or rooftop solar um, that we're already seeing. Uh, the first challenge being that disconnecting during faults and disturbances. And the second challenge is around the dispatchability of that plant. So um, this is particularly, well, this is important in emergency conditions, um, extreme abnormal conditions, um, such as uh, double circuit interconnector out, perhaps we have to manage an islanded region for an extended period of time or abnormally low load, like we're seeing through through COVID, having the ability to be able to dispatch um, that renewable um, distributed fleet is, is really important. Um, the second challenge comes in in that green area there at around 50% um, to do with variability and uncertainty in the supply demand balance. Um, so prior to 50%, a lot of that variability is driven by the load itself. But as we start to go above 50%, that's increasingly driven by coincidental ramps in wind and solar. Um, if we can predict those ramps, that's great. We can have the resources online to cover them. But even with improvements to our forecasting systems, there's still some residual uncertainty. So there's need for greater flexibility in the generation fleet to be able to, to cover those ramps. Um, the, the next area there, that pink area, is to do with frequency control. So as we displace our traditional sources of inertia, um, we are operating in new, new system dynamics. And part of that is making sure that the speed of our frequency control is, is enough to make sure we maintain system security. So I'm not sure how, how the magnitude of, of those challenges sound, sound to you. I, I think to me, that sounds like there's a lot for industry to collectively work through over the next um, five years. But assuming that we, we do that, that takes us to about 75% uh, penetration. So that's where we start to intersect um, with the units that must be online to support backbone system strength. That's not an insurmountable limit. We can transition past that, but we need additional support from some of the technologies that Stephen was talking about, syncoms or, ch or changes to the way that uh, we operate our thermal fleet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And, and um, what's, the, what's the timing on the, the RIS at the moment? Yes, yeah, so um, this this study, the, the Renewable Integration Study has been um, published um, earlier this year in April mm -hmm. and it is, it is um, really a problem definition with some some leading actions that need to be taken, but we're, we're working on um, a more consolidated action plan coming out of that, that work to take to industry um, um, over the rest of this year and early into next year. Okay, fantastic. Looking, looking forward to it, Andrew. Thank you. Now let's move on to our final panelist, um, Dr. Tony Morton from Ella, um, to get a bit of a consultant's view on on the similar type of question. So, uh, as a consultant, Tony, um, how do we support the wider goals of a renewable um, system? Over to you. I think you might be on mute. I'm sorry. Yes, I was warned we ought to unmute ourselves when we're talking. Uh, thank you, but th thank thank you, Mark, and everyone. Um, I uh, I I guess the uh, from, from of Lloyd's Register, what, what, what we're aiming to do is to uh, really assist the industry with um, uh, under, uh, understanding the, the technology transition that uh, we are actually in the midst of and, uh, and, and, and providing the, uh, the, the technical, commercial and, um, and other support tools that, uh, that are needed for the industry to, uh, to, to make progress. Um, and uh, certainly in the time I've, I've been in the industry over 15 years, um, we, we've seen grid connection go from almost being an afterthought in the development of uh, renewable energy projects to, uh, to now being, being seen as a critical project risk. And um, a large part of that is simply because in Australia, we really are on the frontier of this development. Um, we, are, we are now reaching a critical point in the transition. Um, and uh, certainly, if you look at South Australia, they routinely see uh, over 50% energy penetration from wind and solar alone. Um, and uh, from, from the slide Andrew just uh, provided, uh, we, we even see that um, uh, sporadically for the entire NEM um, as, as an instantaneous energy penetration. And uh, this, does, this does raise substantial challenges, as, as, as we know. Um, 
but the at, at the same time, I think it's fair to say that the uh, the, the, the policy support um, needed to guide this transition has been somewhat lacking. Um, to, 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 to to put it dip diplomatically, I guess we, uh, we we have had difficulty having a consistent energy policy in Australia, and 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 I guess this is this is this is the problem because um, get, get, getting things right means we need to be looking at. Um, be just just beyond the number of megawatts that are going into the system from whatever source, and we need we need to consider um, these uh, the, 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 these other factors like efficiency, security, resilience, and also value add um, for, for for the industry. Because of course we operate the electricity system as a market, and that means that um, there. There, there, there really needs to or they, they, all, 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 all of these factors beyond the raw energy that goes into our system. These ancillary services need to have a value proposition, ideally, for the uh, for, for the developers of, of, of projects in order to uh, in order to function within, within this market environment. Um, and uh, and so it, it comes back to policy because we we saw 15 years ago and we see now um, the. Uh, transition toward 100% renewables or even just majority renewables was never going to be a plug and play proposition um, that uh, it, 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 it's quite clear that uh, in, in order for the um, there, there is clearly a market demand for uh, for, for renewable electricity in, in large quantities but for that demand to manifest itself it needs um, the the support from institutions and non-market mechanisms to, uh, to to ensure that the network and the power system can also evolve alongside the uh, the, the, the the generation technology, um, but uh, we 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 still um, don't have all the answers to these uh, to these questions that that that, uh, that were being asked right back in 2005. Who who pays for the uh, for, for, for the for the transition of the system itself? Um, to move from an, an approach based on um, well-defined uh, large generation and load centres to one that's uh, very much based on distributing generation and load around the system and uh, and, and having power generated um, sometimes closer to where it's uh, to where it's being demanded, and uh, but but sometimes a lot further away and in parts of the system that. Uh, that, that were not designed back in the 20th century to accommodate these sources. Um, and another another part of this, which is uh, one we've, we've been looking at substantially, is just bridging this gap between the, the mechanical and electronic paradigms of, uh, of actually running an AC power system. Um, and uh, we, uh, we we have um, so so for the last hundred years, AC power systems have operated very well, um, essentially as um, as as extensions of mechanical systems. We have we 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 continue to run our electric power system um, uh, based on based on mechanical principles because the, uh, the the majority generation sources have in fact been synchronous machines, and the principles of operation of those machines have translated into the principles for how we operate the system as a whole. Now, as we as we displace that technology and we are bringing in different technology that operates on different principles. It does mean the need to to rethink um, the, the the way that we uh, that, that that we conceive of the the the, the fundamental basis of operation of the system. So bridging that gap has uh, there are a number of approaches. Of course, we can put in synchronous condensers in place of um, thermal thermal generators. This is the key to mechanical solution. So it means it's well understood. Um, you can add flywheels to. Put lots of inertia into your system to replace what's 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 lost when you when you retire the coal-fired power stations. At the same time, though, it's um, it's not a silver bullet because it adds a lot of capital cost to projects. It uh, it adds a lot of O&M. If you consider a solar farm, that has no moving parts. So ideally, there's. Uh, there's, there, 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 there's only a certain level of maintenance involved there, but when you when you add a synchronous condenser, you you need to be maintaining that to uh, to, to a much greater extent, um, and uh, and 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 because the, uh, the, the the synchronous condenser is is really just providing a reactive power service, not an active power service, so there's not much value add that you get for the generation owner above that, um, and, uh, and and there are limitations to the capabilities it could provide. An alternative, of course, as we know, is uh, grid forming batteries, um, such such as we have um, at Dalwick, Australia, for example. Um, 
uh, even uh, even grid following batteries such as the uh, the, the Hornsdale battery. Um, uh, they, they all provide firming and arbitrage opportunities, and the grid forming ones provide that, uh, that inertia and system strength service in principle. Of course, it also comes as a price. Um, but there's also a third alternative, of course, and I think Stephen might have hinted at that, um, that you have the integrated generation solution where your actual power plant, whether that's a wind turbine or, um, or, a, uh, or a central solar inverter or, or so on, in fact, has, the, uh, has that grid forming capability to some extent um, built built into it and te technically speaking the difference between grid following and grid forming technology for inverters comes down to how much of the current capability you want to design into the hardware the rest is all in software and uh, and that's uh, that's 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 really a, a, a transition that, uh, that that we need to give more attention to I think um, just uh, how we uh, how we run these control systems to again provide that value add opportunity both for the um, both the generation owner who wants to get the megawatts out of the system, and also for the for, for the system operator, and looking at opportunities to find synergies between the two, so that we can balance those interests and uh, and 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 actually get a value proposition for everyone. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks, Tony. Thanks for that perspective. It's uh, very interesting. We do have a couple of uh, questions um, from the audience, which I would like to go through. Just noting that we are running quite a bit late on time, so we'll just keep these quick. Um, so there's one through to yourself, Andrew. Um, so the question is, uh, when would you be confident to switch off the last synchronous generator in South Australia? <laughs> well, thankfully, I don't. Uh... I don't have to make that uh, decision, but um, as, as the questioner probably um, uh, no doubt knows, there's there's syncons that are uh, um, slated to fill fill that synchronous support role for South Australia. Um, not speaking um, as AEMO, but speaking as an as an engineer, I'd think the transition from those existing um, thermal generation. Um, that, that's there to, to the syncons only would be something that would be done in a staged way. So it wouldn't be something that we, we do in simulation and um, decide that we know how that works. There would be some um, transitional um, process there to make sure that not only we're we learning from, from sim simulations and theory, but we're, we're learning from experience to do that. Um, we also need to make sure that we have all of the other support services in South Australia that we need to operate Shredded Island, um, um, yeah, um, frequency control, etc. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, one last question, and, and this is for yourself, Tom. Um, so the question was, what do you see the future power station looking like? So what kinds of tech? Um, uh, how is it integrating with the wider system um, and so forth? Yeah, great, great question. And not, not, not a small one to answer. Um, there's, been a, there's, there's a common thread, I think, a couple of the responses now have been speaking about grid forming or synthetic inertia. Um, I do see that as a fundamental part of, of what we need to do. I, I respect Stephen's comment that it doesn't have to be on every generating system, but it needs to be sprinkled throughout the generating, uh, the, the, not the generating system, the overall system. Um, I think that's fundamental. Um, I, when it comes to the, the, the spinning mass of the, of the uh, synchronous condensers, I, though I respect the physics and we love the physics, uh, seeing the sort of the active power consumption and the O&M costs and everything else that come with synchronous condensers, I, I do trust that we're going to minimise those um, uh, throughout the system. And, and obviously there's, there can be some unwanted um, artefacts when we've got all these disparate spinning, little spinning masses around the system. So I really hope that it's going to be vastly not too much focused on synchronous condensers, but there's going to be a lot of grid forming, syn uh, synthetic inertia renewable energy sources that's what i would say okay thanks for thanks for that perspective tom now i think we're we're running very short on time here so so let's wrap it up so first of all i'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us here today and taking the time to uh 
answer my questions and to share your thoughts with um, with our audience here. I think it's been a great discussion. Good to see some really different perspectives, especially from yourself, Stephen, with the US approach. Um, Andrew, with the, what's happening at the regulator and certainly Tom with the developers. And, and of course, Tony with um, a consultant and LR's position on the, on the matter. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we uh, will be sharing with everybody the the um, recording of this session afterwards, um, so you can you can listen back to it in your your private time. Um, and if you do have any other questions that you need uh, that you'd like us to to answer, uh, some of our um, contact details have been provided there as well. So uh, thank you all again for your time, and um, I hope you have a good day. See you later.